Hey everybody, it is New Year's weekend. I just got back from my holiday break, which I spent with family and friends out in Massachusetts. And even though I was hundreds of miles away, I was still able to access all of the home services from my home server. In this video, I'm gonna be showing you how I did that. Basically, I created my own VPN using a technology known as WireGuard. Even though I was out there hundreds of miles away, I could still access my Nextcloud, my Jellyfin, all of these services that I self-host in a home server. For this video, I'm gonna be showing you how to do it via port forwarding. You're gonna point a domain name to your public IP of your router, and then that is gonna to point to the Raspberry Pi. I'm gonna have a little diagram here for better clarification. I, I like to show diagrams so that people just don't blindly run things without understanding what's happening. You are gonna have a device. This is gonna be a cell phone, a laptop with a WireGuard connection. Basically, this request is going to go to some access point. It can be a 5G antenna, it can be someone else's Wi-Fi, and then that is gonna to go to a URL. Uh, in this case, it's the DuckDNS URL. That is gonna to point to your router's IP address, the public IP address, and then that request is gonna to go to the Raspberry Pi through WireGuard, and then that is gonna send it back through your router into the open internet. So any service in the open internet is gonna make it look like your, your request is coming from your home router instead of a 5G antenna. While this is great, it also allows you, since you're connected to your router, to access all of the home services in the Raspberry Pi or any other servers that are connected to your network. And I think that is pretty sweet. Now for this, like I said, we're gonna be using WireGuard. We're going to be using a container for .dns, which will basically update the IP address every time that it changes. In North America, IP addresses for home addresses tend to like rotate, and if you want a static IP address, you need to pay extra or have some sort of business account. We don't want that, right? So DuckDNS has a service that basically every time it detects that the IP changes or every like five minutes it checks, it then updates the domain name pointer so that you don't have to worry about that and it's always up to date, which is pretty awesome. Now for this video, you're going to need to sign up to DuckDNS. It provides like a free domain name server so you don't have to pay. Now, if you wanna pay and you wanna have your own domain, that's okay, you know, go for it. Uh, the steps are gonna be pretty similar, although you will need to find a way to update the IP address of that domain uh, depending on what on which service you use. For the, so for this video, everything is gonna be free and we're gonna be using port forwarding. We signed up for DuckDNS using the Google OAuth. Uh, this is the dashboard that you get. You have a token and your account, uh, email address, all of this is fine and dandy. Obviously for me, I'm gonna blur it out because this is kind of like private information or semi-private. All you need to do is create a subdomain that we're gonna be using to use with our VPN. This subdomain needs to be unique. Unfortunately, because a lot of people use DuckDNS, it's kind of hard to find like unique subdomain. So we're gonna try something and see if it works. Let's do CF for code fallacy dash VPN. Let's add this domain. Oh, unfortunately, it is taken by another user. Okay, so let's do CF VPN without the dash. Maybe we can get lucky. And we did. Every time we access cf.vpn.dns.org, it's just going to point to my IP address. Obviously, this is blurred out, but you should be able to see your IP address. Because this IP address can change, we would need to like re-log into DocDNS and update it manually every time it changes. We don't want to do that. So DuckDNS provides a service that it, right here, you can basically has been containerized by the Linux server IO team, but you can install it normally if you don't wanna use a container. Let's scroll down here. Let's copy this configuration. Let's go to our Raspberry Pi. We're gonna be creating a directory called WireGuard. We're gonna enter that directory. And then in here, we're gonna paste the configuration into a Docker Compose file. So doc nano docker-compose.yaml. Then here, we're going to paste that configuration and this image for this container is pretty that simple. All you need to do is come here and add the subdomains that you would like to use. For example, ours is cfvpn.dns.org, but you don't need to provide that. Then you need to paste the token right here of your account so that it can authenticate and actually update the IP address. Let's go back to the DocDNS dashboard. 
Let's copy this token right here. And then let's go back to our Docker compose. Um, and the last thing we need to do, of course, is point to the correct path for the configuration. Like you've seen in other videos, I like to go to the home slash the user, which in this case is called fallacy. Whatever the user is for your Linux server, whether it's a Raspberry Pi or any other server, this is the path that we wanted to go to. And then WireGuard. When we run this Docker configuration for DuckDNS, it should create a config file inside of the WireGuard directory that we just created. Let's do Control O to save it and then Control X to exit. If we do Docker compose up and then we want to run it in detached mode so that when we close the terminal, it doesn't automatically close, close the container. That's why you see this little dash D. Okay. And just like that is going to download the container and get it running. And that's all you need to do for updating your duck DNS subdomain to always have your IP address. Now that we're done with the duck DNS portion, we need to go, let's close this one out and set up the WireGuard container. For WireGuard, we're going to follow the same path, right? Let's scroll down to the configuration for the YAML or this big old config right here. Let's copy it. Then let's go back to our Raspberry Pi. Let's CD back home. And at the home level, we are going to create a directory called WireGuard. Let's CD into WireGuard. And then in here, we're going to paste that Docker, com uh, that Docker compose YAML configuration. So nano Docker compose .yaml. And then in here, we're going to paste the configuration. This is also a pretty simple Docker container It's pretty awesome. Um, but you will need to make a couple of changes. The first one is how many peers do you want? Basically, because we're not going to be using a user interface or sort of UI, you need to specify how many distinct connections you want to be allowed for your WireGuard. For example, I have a distinct connection for my phone. I have a distinct connection for my spouse. I have a distinct connection for like a bunch of different computers, which basically total to a lot. So what I like to do is just create 10, even if you don't use all of them, having extras never really hurt. And you can distinguish which people connect to your WireGuard configuration from others. So let's create 10. Uh, the port is correct. Um, allowed IPs. I'm going to comment this out because you would need to like specify which one. I think if you just leave it at zero, 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 it should work, but please just comment it out for the sake of simplicity. We need to add the server URL. We basically created our own duck DNS. This is where we would add the, that domain. So let's do it again. CF VPN duck DNS dot org. Let's update the volume. I just like I do for all my configurations. It's always going to be at the home user of the Linux, which is code fallacy. I know I sound like a broken record and then the name of the service in this case, WireGuard. I like to do the same thing for modules, even though it is claimed as an optional thing. Uh, it's, I think it's just better to have it created at that local folder. So now it's going to create a config inside of WireGuard and a modules directory inside of that. And that's pretty much it. I think we're good to go. So if we do control O to save it, enter control X to exit, we should be able to just compose up dash D this container. Just like that, it is done. The last thing that we need to do, we need to forward all the traffic for port 51820. We need to forward all the traffic that comes through that port in our own router to the IP to the local IP address of our Raspberry Pi. So in my ASUS router, all I need to do is go to the wide area networks or WAN, then up here, port forwarding. And basically I have another machine doing all the work, but I am going to change it so that we can use our Raspberry Pi now as our WireGuard server. And just like that, everything is hooked up. Um, I forgot to mention when doing the port forward that you should make sure that the protocol for the port forwarding is UDP, not TCP. 
UDP, please. For the sake of this video, I'm going to be showing you how to connect your WireGuard server to a mobile device like a smartphone. If you don't want to use a smartphone or you want to use a laptop, you should be able to follow along except for the part where you show a QR code. Instead, you just copy over the configuration. What you need to do is install the WireGuard client in your mobile device or your computer or wherever you want to use it. And then in here, let's go back to the WireGuard. If we do LS, you should see a configuration directory has been created in the WireGuard folder. Let's CD into that config and do LS. And you can see all of the peers that were created. Basically, these are unique accounts for WireGuard to be used. For my phone, let's use peer three. Let's CD into peer three. And in here, you will see either a conf file, a PNG, which we are going to copy over to the host machine and a bunch of other things. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to use a command called SCP to copy over just the QR code. Uh, for that, we need to know the working directory. So pwd to print the working directory. We're going to copy this over. We're going to open a new tab. And then in here, we need to do SCP, secure copy. We need to specify the user, which is code fallacy, and then at, and then the IP of our Raspberry Pi, which is a local IP of 192.168.50 dot one one six then we need a column and then we need to paste the um, uh, the path that we just copied over and since we're just copying over the image we're going to do peer dot png oh sorry peer three dot png and we're going to copy it over to our local users um, the host machine this is like the path for the host machine uh, the user for this is LPM and then desktop. And because I, it should ask you for a password unless you added a secure key. I added a secure key, it didn't ask me for a password, which means that Pure 3 is now available in our desktop. If we go to Finder, Desktop, you can now see right here. This QR code right here is all we need. So let me record on my phone. Now you should be able to see my phone. If we go to the WireGuard application, let me disconnect this. This is an old WireGuard connection. Let's add a new one. And we're just going to scan the QR code, allow only this time, and then we should be able to scan it. Once we scan it, we just add a name. Let's do code fallacy peer three. Oh, I think I exceeded the name. Okay. Let's just call it peer three and then create that tunnel and let's disconnect from Wi-Fi. And with my phone, we should be able to go to something that will show our IP. So this is the IP address of my phone. I'm not going to show the whole thing but it does end in 229. Once we enable this peer three, we should now see a different IP in this web page. And we do, we see our actual home IP. And just like that, you have WireGuard set up and you should be able to access local services. To finally wrap up this video, I am going to show you here how I can access my Jellyfin instance that I'm running on another server, even though I am on 5G, which means I am outside of the network. As you can see, I can go to the local IP here and it accesses Jellyfin. And just for shits and giggle, let's do a speed test. Let's go to fast.com or fast.net and you know, pretty good. 50 plus download over the VPN. That's not bad at all. If you found this video helpful, uh, give it a like. I really appreciate it. And if you want to stick around, please subscribe.